And the first speaker is uh, by video conference, Pierre Salati from uh, ANSI. Pierre, try to speak, please. Yes, I hear you. Do you hear me? Yes, we do. Okay. So um, thank you very much indeed uh, for your uh, kind invitation and uh, for your patience and for uh, allowing me, in fact, to participate numerically, not physically, but I couldn't, um, to this um, very nice conference in memory of, uh, of uh, Pierre. So, um, so um, in fact, I would like to talk about the the early career of Pierre in the Alps. So if we could go from slide one to slide two, please. Um, because Pierre, in fact, spent uh, uh, really the beginning of his career, in fact, both at CERN and uh, in Annecy. And so there are very three very important dates, in fact, um, uh, for um, uh, the early career of, of Pierre. Um, there is um, 1980, um, when Pierre got his PhD at CERN under the supervision of uh, Mar Marie Kay, Marie Kay Gaillard, who um, spoke this morning. Then in uh, 1986, um, he was hired at CNRS as Chargé de Recherche in the uh, Annecy group. In fact, at that time, there was um, a small group of theoreticians uh, in uh, Laboratoire d'Annecy de, de Physique des Particules, which is a, a, a High energy uh, particle physics lab, well, that has been settled, which, which has been created in Annecy in uh, 1976. And then, well, Pierre became in 1990 a full professor at Paris University, so uh, at Orsay University. And so there is um, a period of, of time of 10 years during which, in fact, Pierre was in the Alps, both at CERN and, uh, and in Annecy. So if we could go to slide three, please. So. Um, between 1980 and 1983, Pierre was uh, a, a Sun Fellow, and uh, he was mostly at Sun and sometimes in Annecy. Um, and then uh, from 83 to 85, from the fall of 1983 to 1985, Pierre was in fact uh, at UC Berkeley working with Marie Kay Gagar. He was a postdoc there. Um, uh, and uh, from 1985 to 1986, he visited actually Florida University in Gainesville and uh, also Chicago University. And so you'll have actually uh, a talk by Pierre Ramon uh, uh, and, and uh, in Florida, in Gainesville, Pierre interacted with Pierre Ramon and with Pierre Sikivi. And then finally, uh, between 1986 and 1990, then Pierre was in Annecy and uh, he collaborated, of course, uh, with many people, um, of course, with Mary Kay, but also he started um, uh, an ongoing collaboration with Jean Girardi and Richard Grimm on supergravity. Okay, so if we could move to slide six. Okay, so as for me, in fact, well, my recollection uh, uh, of, of Pierre, well, uh, is in this period of time, uh, and actually, I, I moved to Annecy uh, and I started my PhD at LAP in 1981. And then I moved to Berkeley as a postdoc in 1987. And I went back to Berkeley to be a Sun Fellow in 1989. So we had three periods of time with Pierre during which we uh, interacted and we overlapped. And I'd like really to concentrate on the very first one when I started my PhD. During one year, I was supervised by John Ellis and then um, Jean Girardi and Pierre Benetruy also uh, were my supervisors during the second year, starting at the beginning of this, the second year of my thesis. So from 82 to 83. And, and actually, well, um, if we could move to slide seven, please. Um, then we really uh, had a collaboration, uh, Pierre, uh, Georges and I, and collaboration on the co-annihilation of weakly interacting massive particles. Uh, in the early universe. And so um, if we could go to the slide eight, where I'm going to talk about the paper which we wrote, the three of us, that's a paper on the constraints on a system of two neutral fermions from cosmology that in fact we um, published in 1984. And that is really a work uh, between um, 83, 80, during the year of 83, in fact. So the idea was, 
basically to enlarge and to generalize the previous analysis by uh, Ben Lee and uh, Steven Weinberg uh, on the behavior of a stable, weakly interacting massive particle in the early universe. So the idea is quite simple. You have that particle that exists as a radiation when the temperature is very large. And then when the temperature drops below the mass, the particle starts to annihilate. And OK, so its density decreases down to the point where the, the, the particle is so diluted that the probability for a particle to annihilate, well, becomes less than 100 percent per expansion time. And so to speak, well, when the density drops, the annihilation rate becomes less than the expansion rate and the particles, in fact, gets frozen and its density, it's, the particle is stable, its density is constant. And, and in fact, all the calculations uh, basically of uh, the behavior of uh, stable uh, particles interacting uh, through weak interactions and that, that are massive follow basically that approach by, by Lee and, and Weinberg. And so if we could go to slide number nine, please. So we decided, and that was, I think, uh, mostly Pierre's idea to generalize the analysis by Lee and Weinberg to a system of two neutral fermions. Um, and, and actually, well, we, in fact, well, that could, well, uh, well that, that, that could look very theoretical, uh, where we had uh, in the system uh, N1, which was the heaviest state, and N2, which was the, the lightest one. But actually, well, um, this is really a common situation in supersymmetry where you have the lightest supersymmetric state, the so-called uh, LSP, well, that, that, that in fact interacts during its uh, uh, early universe cooking with the next to LSP particle. So we could think of N1 in modern words as the next to LSP and N2 as the LSP. And so uh, on this slide number nine, you see, well, two panels. On the left one, you have, well, the series of interactions that come into play. In the original paper by Lee and Weinberg, with only, in fact, one neutral fermion, you just have the annihilation. You see the uh, Feynman diagram, the one which is on the top left corner of the left panel. But now, well, when you have several particles, at least two of them, then things get more complicated. And that was, in fact, part of my PhD thesis to work that out. And uh, so, well, uh, we did that. Uh, and, and basically, well, um, uh, this depends really, the behavior, the cosmological behavior of that system depends really on whether or not the particles can self-annihilate or need each other to annihilate. In fact, on the right uh, panel of that slide number nine, which you have is the evolution of the LSP density where you have uh, the so-called anti-diagonal coupling, where in fact uh, the LSP and the NLSP just interact with each other and need each other to annihilate. So the LSP cannot annihilate on itself and the NLSP cannot annihilate on itself. But you need to have, uh, um, a, a, well, you need to have a, a mutual annihilation, a co-annihilation. And in, in that case, well, the point is that, well, the next to LSP, the light, the, the heaviest state, starts to disappear when the temperature drops below its mass. And you need to have it floating around at the time when actually the lightest state starts, in fact, to become non-relativistic and would like also to annihilate. And so on the right panel, you have uh, the basic result which we got, which is that in case of real co-annihilation, no mutual annihilation, but really annihilation of LSP on NLSP, what you get is that the annihilation is very strong when the mass splitting is very small. So when the mass splitting is very high, when M1 is 15 GB, for instance, M1 disappears, and at the time where M2 would like, in fact, to disappear, there is no more, no, nothing left. Okay, so maybe if we could go to the next slide. Um, that is basically the same as before, but on the right panel, you have a different situation. And I'm showing, I'm showing, uh, well, I'd like to show you, in fact, really, this, uh, this panel, because I have a very vivid memory of Pierre, coming to Annecy to check really my results. And I, I remember Pierre actually 
working out through my computer output to really check if the results which I got were, well, did make sense. And uh, in the case which is shown on the right panel, and you take specifically the left case where M1 is 5 GV and uh, M2 is 5 GV and M1 is 5.5 GV, it turns out that we are in the case where we just have a diagonal coupling. So the LSP annihilates on the LSP, the NLSP on the NLSP. But at some point, in fact, the, lot, the heaviest state just, in fact, uh, decays into the lightest one. And you can see the curve here of the density N2 that increases when N1, in fact, well, drops after a time of basically four times 10 to the minus three seconds. So really, well, I have a very vivid memory of Pierre checking and really looking uh, at that decay and of, of the NLSP and the increase in the LSP. Pierre was uh, very careful in, in his check and uh, he was really want, he wanted really to make sure that the results did make sense. Okay, so I, I, I'm coming to the, the end of my, uh, of my contribution. Uh, so next, next slide, and this is the last one. So, of course, well, uh, I miss Pierre terribly. We all miss Pierre. And uh, I think that, well, Pierre was someone who paved the road for us. He was uh, uh, one of the pioneers uh, of particle astrophysics in France. Well, and he created the APC. And uh, I, I think I, I, I would like to remember him. And we will always remember him, uh, of course, as one of the brightest theoreticians of, the, of this generation, but uh, well, we, sh we will remember him uh, for his generosity, his kindness, and really his dedication to others. So thank you very much, Pierre, for all you did for us. And thank you, my dear colleagues, well, to uh, have allowed me to, to well, testify how much I, 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 I'm in pain uh, with uh, um, Pierre disappearing. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My first reaction said, well, I've never worked uh, really with Pierre. Uh, we did not publish anything together, so maybe we should let some uh, other closer colleagues speak. Uh, he insisted, so here I am. Uh, and so uh, I will say just a few words, but basically uh, recalling and giving you a few flashes where uh, at occasions where I met Pierre, and uh, uh, certainly I remember these uh, instances very well. And so I will go through a few of these uh, encounters with, uh, with Pierre. Um, curiously, I think our first, the first time I met him, it was totally accidental. I mean, uh, it was not planned in any, in any way. And probably it was before most of you here have met him, except Louis. Um, uh, it was... Um, uh, in 1975, so I was um, at uh, Stanford at that time, and uh, there was, curiously, I don't remember the, how it was arranged, but there was a visit of some French students uh, uh, in the Bay Area uh, to Berkeley and, and Stanford, and uh, there was a small party organized by the, the, con the French consulate in San Francisco, and uh, here I met a, a bunch of, of young guys, uh, uh, among which uh, Pierre was. And uh, they were from uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure de Saint-Cloud. And uh, I uh, tried to, uh, uh, to get uh, um, closer to the truth by talking to, to Louis. Uh, Pierre uh, uh, integrated that school at the end of 1974, so it was during his first year in uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure. And it turned out I'm also from the same school, so we found immediately a subject of uh, 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 talking together. And um, uh, it's funny, because uh, I met this uh, young student. Uh, I gave him my best wishes for his uh, future career, but I did not know he was to develop into the, the person we know and that we miss very much today. Uh, then uh, I had to wait uh, until Pierre was uh, 
proposed to be a professor at Orsay, and so he came at Orsay in 1990, and uh, <coughs> Lal is very close to the theory lab, and I think it was certainly one of the first visits uh, he paid to us, and so I was the uh, director at that time, and so he came to my office and we discussed about uh, uh, the physics of the time. It was just the early times of uh, LEP, and so we were just uh, in the first results uh, on neutrinos, uh, first uh, Higgs searches, and so on, and, and started uh, supersymmetry uh, also. And so there were plenty of subjects to, to discuss, and I was immediately struck by his uh, personality. I mean, somebody uh, very open, uh, very kind. Uh, uh, Pierre Ramon uh, used the word civilized, uh, which is really quite adapted. Um, in our community, not everyone is uh, civilized. And so it's worth noticing when somebody uh, behaves uh, like he did. And so these discussions were um, very fruitful and uh, uh, they were uh, really uh, uh, telling us that we were fortunate to have him at Orsay and uh, readily available to discuss physics, uh, which uh, turned out to be true. And uh, we, we used him many times. Uh, well, used him is maybe not the right word, but we, we had plenty of opportunities to, to discuss with him. Uh, Another area which was not uh, talked about here is that uh, being a young professor at Orsay, he had to teach, and to teach even uh, undergraduate and even first-year students, which was uh, usually a challenge uh, uh, if you are a brilliant uh, theoretical physicist and you have to adapt yourself and uh, so forth. And he, uh, one of his first uh, assignments was to teach to first-year medicine students. Well, it turned out I had uh, uh, done a lot of that before, and I, I was quite, uh, um, uh, that's something I liked very much. And uh, I, I had made uh, quite a few improvements there uh, at Orsay uh, by having a lot of experiments done in the classroom, which was quite unusual when you have 300 people in the classroom uh, uh, and future doctors who are not necessarily attracted by physics and so forth. And, and so that worked very well. But later on, I think the colleagues which replaced me uh, continued this. Uh, so they did not care too much about these experiments. It's a uh, it's quite uh, a challenge, I mean, to do these experiments in front of all these young guys and to, to, to teach them something. And I was very happy that when Pierre uh, did that, he restarted these uh, classroom experiments. And him, I mean, a theorist, I, mean, I was not expecting that, so I remember very, very well. Uh, and so he uh, insisted to, to have these experiments uh, done in the uh, amphitheater, which was quite unusual uh, at that time. And so the, I started to like him very much uh, uh, as really having uh, really good, uh, good ideas and rather unconventional then another occasion, uh, we had then plenty of occasion, but he, he gave lectures at, uh, at LAL. We, we had introduced uh, earlier the habit of having uh, uh, lectures in the fall or in winter, uh, depending, and we invited him to give lecture on supersymmetry. And I remember very well these lectures, must have been in the late 90s, and uh, he gave these lectures, and uh, people were quite excited. There was one student particularly uh, eager to learn supersymmetry and who turned out to do all the home exercises that Pierre was giving. It was Thibaut Damour <laughs> who was listening uh, there, and uh, he was asking a lot of questions, and he certainly learned a lot of supersymmetry during this, uh, during this week. Uh, then uh, I should, of course, mention that uh, I had a lot of discussion with Pierre in the, in the canteen at Orsay about <coughs> the opening of IN2P3 and LAL in particular to astroparticle and cosmology, which, uh, uh, well, Pierre was a very kind person. I mean, as I said, very civilized and uh, even a charming person to talk to, but he had very strong conviction and uh, when he felt uh, something like uh, astroparticle should be 
part of the program of IN2P3, uh, he really meant it. And, and so we had uh, lively discussions, and he was quite critical, although I think we had already started to move in this direction, but uh, that was nothing like the energy that Pierre was going to put into this, uh, this endeavor. I think he was enthusiastic about pushing the, this thing. He, he was convincing. He, uh, he had a, a vision, and uh, he, uh, the rest of his career showed that he was uh, clearly right. That was really the right way to go. There was, uh, even if Francois says that we don't understand the connection between uh, infinitely small and infinitely large, it is one of the main ideas of, uh, of the physics uh, which, uh, which is allowing us to, to make a lot of progress, even if we don't understand uh, everything, of course. And then what was immediately obvious is that Pierre had the... Uh, the ability really to, to coordinate things, to organize, to get moving and to, to get people together and that clearly extremely uh, uh, in a very convincing way. And my, my last uh, flash on, uh, on Pierre was in June uh, 2014 uh, where uh, at the Academy of Science I, I had uh, Organize. Uh, we have um, uh, every every other month uh, about. We have uh, a conference uh, uh, to the public and to the academy at large. I mean, not only physicists, and uh, where we take uh, the the big questions which are at the moment. And I had organized with Jean Lou Puget a session on uh, which was called. Uh, 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 big questions in physics, uh, in cosmology, and, uh, and fundamental physics. And naturally, I, I called Pierre to give a talk there, and uh, asking him to talk about uh, uh, the dark energy and any theoretical ideas about dark energy. Well, it was clear from the talk that uh, we had a lot of ideas, but uh, not... Uh, not uh, any yet practical thing inside, but he gave a very, very clear talk, I mean, uh, as usual. And uh, actually, Pierre, uh, also Salati, was also a part of this uh, session, talking to us about uh, uh, dark matter. And uh, I think we had a very likely, uh, very lively afternoon. These uh, conferences are not easy to deliver because they are addressed uh, to the full academy, so even biologists, and so, uh, and so the public is also admitted. And so uh, you have to, to give a talk which can interest uh, the public, so people who are not experts. Uh, and yet, you should not disappoint uh, the physicists, which are which are there, and very eager to uh, to to ask the uh, their their uh, very focused questions. So it's uh, it's an exercise which is uh, difficult, and uh, Pierre did it uh, brilliantly. Actually, you can see the video of this program on the site of, of the academy. So. Uh, this is what I wanted to say. I'm, I'm sorry it's a bit uh, disorganized. Uh, I have not uh, prepared a, a big, uh, a nice talk uh, as uh, some other people. But I, I recall this occasion with, uh, uh, of course, a lot of sadness that we have uh, lost him, but also uh, that it was a great experience to meet him, uh, somebody with uh, such a clear vision of, uh, of our field, uh, full of ideas, full of energy, uh, enthusiastic, uh, capable to, to draw people uh, into, into this uh, thing. So it's, uh, I think, somebody uh, very dear to our community, which we lost. Um. I am going to read the, the text by Stefan Pokorski. Pierre played a very important role in our group in Warsaw in developing research at the interface of particle physics and cosmology. However, in this short message, I would rather like to share with you a few moments with Pierre that will always remember my family and myself. Pierre visited us in our house in Warsaw on several occasions. Once, during his visit, I had to move to leave the house for a while and Pierre stayed with my wife. Later, she was telling me, what a charming young boy. 
he told me a lot about his work, and I think I understood almost everything. <laughs> and into parenthesis, Stefan adds, by the way, my wife knows nothing about physics. At some point, he told me, close your eyes. Imagine the sky full of stars. This is where my thoughts are. I am trying to understand all that. The other story I would like to tell is probably known to a wider cycle of people, but since it was witnessed by my son, I feel it is also her story. My son studied at Ecole Normale in Paris, and in his DOA program, he attended a course on gauge theories given by Pierre, and he told me this story. Once, waiting for Pierre in the classroom, they see a TV team with cameramen entering the room and waiting for the professor to record him. Finally, Pierre appears. First, they pay no attention to him. One more student comes. But later, seeing Pierre starting his lecture, they mumble, oh, you are the professor. Well, there is not enough light in this room to record. Let us move to, to another room. A charming young boy. This is how Pierre remains in our thoughts of my family and mine. Well, I, I was uh, neither a collaborator of Pierre nor uh, a close personal friend <coughs> of him. <coughs> but uh, when I was informed of this event, uh, I felt, as many of you, that it was uh, impossible not to be here to honor his memory. And I was prepared to be here and listen, but I thank the organizers for uh, uh, permitting me to say, uh, it, for inviting me to say a few world, words. I think uh, I met uh, Pierre first in uh, Berkeley when uh, uh, I was a postdoc uh, a few years after his uh, term, uh, but uh, he was uh, coming uh, uh, to collaborate with, uh, uh, Mary, with Mary Kay. And uh, during uh, our careers, our research interests have uh, had considerable overlap in general terms, uh, grand unification, supersymmetry, and uh, supergravity and uh, more specifically, the linear multiplet and D-terms in supergravity, supersymmetry breaking, our parity violation, the possibility of dynamical uh, uh, UCAVA couplings. And uh, because of this, uh, we were meeting uh, uh, quite often at conferences and also in thesis uh, committee, both in Paris, in Padua, and elsewhere. I remember coming here, for example, for the PhD defen defense by Emilian uh, Dudas. So uh, there, there are many talks at this conference uh, um, celebrating his achievements as a scientist and also as a high-level scientific organizer. And there is little I can add to, to that. I'm impressed also by his qualities uh, that uh, I would uh, even define of a, a scientific statement for what we, he did for astroparticle physics in the in the Paris uh, uh, area. I, was, I want, just want to remember uh, a few personal things. I remember him uh, uh, vividly, despite uh, our limited amount uh, of interaction, as a gentle and uh, generous uh, person. In, uh, for example, I remember that in one of my first visits to Paris, Despite being uh, overburdened by many things, uh, he spent uh, with me several hours just to show me the beauties of uh, Marais. And uh, last time I saw him uh, was uh, at the Higgs Hunting uh, Conference uh, in uh, Orsay in 2015, in summer 2015. Pierre was giving a plenary talk there, and I was charged by the organizers of the summary talk. And uh, in that occasion, uh, I could appreciate uh, two of his uh, uh, many qualities. Uh, first of all, his uh, modesty and uh, generosity. He could have spoken about his last work on the subject. Uh, and he decided instead uh, to review some uh, recent papers on the possibility of a dynamical relaxation of the weak scale that had appeared that spring, if I remember. 
and uh, that were exciting some uh, uh, curiosity. And also his uh, pedagogical skills, which are uh, unquestionable. I mean, he was able to deliver a, a talk that was uh, rich of information that could be enjoyed both by the theorists and by the experimentalists that, that were there in the audience, uh, uh, irrespectively on their level of uh, specialization. So I think these are just uh, a few of the many uh, reasons uh, why our memory of Pierre is and we remain uh, very vivid, and we all miss him. Thank you. Thank you very much. These slides were pre prepared by Jean-Francois, but due to family uh, problems, he, he cannot be here. So as an exercise for me, I also decided to write it in French, and I will have to give it in English. <laughs> so... Jean-François had, had met uh, Pierre a number of times before, but he really started co collaborating with him in 1991 when Pierre joined the uh, Morion Electroic um, Organizing Committee. At that time, it was still uh, uh, a, smaller co a smaller committee and with people just from uh, the area, so they could meet uh, in a room and actually draw the, uh, the agenda on the blackboard. Uh, th that's when he, he, they started to interact a lot more together, and from that time, along the discussion, came the idea of what became the GDR supersymmetry, something that brings together experimentalists and, and theoreticians. So Jean-Francois wanted to thank Rémi Lafaye for finding out where the early uh, GDR web pages were from 1997 and uh, putting them online. Um, so the GR was created in 1997, and Pierre was the director of, uh, 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 of the GDR for the first period, which was four years, and then for the next period, and the, un so until 2004. So the first meeting of the GR was taking place in Lyon, where Pierre gave uh, the kind of overall program of the, the GDR. I won't read uh, everything, but he says that uh, the GDR, Groupement de Recherche, aims at the bringing together the community of experimentalists and theoreticians, uh, interested in research for supersymmetry. Later, it was expanded to physics beyond the standard model. And uh, really trying to actually uh, suscite actual collaboration between experimentalist and, and theoreticians, which is not easy in, in the domain where you have kind of, say experimentalists, we have non-disclosure agreement, uh, we cannot speak about the internal or internal results, but still we could discuss the public results and, uh, and see how public horizon from one do domain of exp uh, experiment talk to other domain of this experiment and to theories. So at this time, uh, when the GR was proposed, it was not completely obvious that it would be approved, so they, uh, they brought together a uh, advisory committee, say, with uh, very famous names uh, in our community. I won't read them all, but uh, and of course, Pierre was part of it, and Jean-Francois, and many of the people, some of the people are also around here. Then the GR was accepted for, so initially for four years, and uh, seven working groups were created. Um, and these were the MSSM, the NMSSM, the uh, LSP, so LSP and Cosmology, RPIT, Flavors. And then there's something, some, something we didn't see a lot in conferences and uh, uh, work about supersymmetry, a, a group that was de dedicated to really the tools that for supersymmetry, like uh, spectrum generators, like uh, uh, genera uh, event generators, etc. And I think the one, this is one of the things that is really uh, kind of been initiated by GDR. And uh, it's tools that allows the different communities to talk together on a, on a, on a, with a reference basis. Then there was a group called Strategy which was code of the uh, intra, say, how the, the, the anticipated result from LEP, what would it mean for linear collider, for LHC, et cetera, what are the interplay between cosmology and, uh, and direct search at, at, uh, at colliders. 
But in fact, the, uh, this group decided to um, kind of commit suicide after two, after two years because it turned out that the, the, the work in the, in, the general, in the other working group was going on so well and people were talking together so well that the, this strategy kind of emerged by itself. The, uh, the, um, on the other hand, the, the tool group really live for very long, still live uh, in the GDR now, and also has an influence well beyond uh, what was the, the GDR, because it, uh, it initiated a series of conferences, which was called Tool for Suzy, um, in, uh, 19, from 1999 to 2000. It was yearly, and then later on, it, uh, it occurred at, uh, every other year, or maybe every few years, and it's still going on. So this is one of the legacy of uh, the early uh, GDR. This is also within this context that was developed the, um, the problem which called suspect, which is still alive in, in various in incarnations, and which gave us really a, a tool where we understood all the ingredients in, in say, the renormalization group equations, uh, the way the, the, the various uh, corrections were implemented, etc. It kind of referenced that we knew well, and from to which we could compare all the, the other spectrum generators in the market. So in, in general, the general were meet, meeting twice a year for general meetings, so it means plenary meeting plus meeting for the working groups, and then the, uh, the working groups could, could organize other meetings uh, in between. At the time, it was, anyway, it was really the, more like the French community, the, the, people actually working in France, and um, the, we were working in, in French. Even though, even at the very beginning, there were invited speakers from, uh, from abroad, from, from CERN, from Germany, etc. So in 1999, it turns out, it, it was a period that was really hot because you have the, the lab results, you, you, you have lots of the, the, the result from the direct, direct search for dark matter, <laughs> etc., coming up. So it, it came up that the, we needed some very specialized groups, maybe on a very uh, dedicated subject, maybe for a short period of time. And there was no these new groups that have been um, introduced were on uh, extra dimensions, and uh, one was called Beyond. So Beyond is, was Beyond everything else. So it was either non minimal models, uh, non-universal Suzy breaking terms, etc. And they had to find a name for it. And I think the Groupement de Recherche uh, uh, Advisory Board uh, was working on it, and Pierre and, Fran and Jean-Francois trying to find out, and they found some kind of inspiration for the hot subject in the news at that time, which was uh, uh, People uh, that say mili semi military people illegally burning illegal cabins in Corsica. They said these people were called the group, group de peloton de sécurité. And so they, they liked the, the acronym, so they took the acronym and then they had to figure out what it means in terms of GDR. So they, they found out it was the group de priorité supersymmetrique. Um, other GPS were invented uh, later. It was really meant to be like a, a task force working on a very specific su subject for, for a few, for a dedicated period. And it was, I think, one of the success of this uh, GDR at the time. It was a very, there was lots of new ideas uh, around. Uh, it was not the time of the LHC now that we still had not a found the supersymmetry. At that time, I think we thought that maybe supersymmetry was just around the corner in, in LEP and then later in LHC. That turned out not to be the case, but there were lots of ideas uh, <coughs> popping around and that the response, our response was these, those GPS. Uh, another aspect of the GR that Jean-François wanted to point out, point out is uh, also towards education, education of the younger people. Uh, one thing is this, uh, at the beginning of the GDR, there were even courses uh, of supersymmetry for, for the young students that came into starting their thesis. 
uh, somebody mentioned this uh, physics report that we had. I think it was a reference at the point. And also, Jean-François mentioned that at the time it was maybe the first opportunity from some of the students to present their work in front of real experts that were not shy of asking questions, but it was a friendly atmosphere. And also the first opportunity to work in really in collaboration and collaboration between theorists and experimentalists, which at, at that time there was not a lot of other opportunity to do it. That might be the lab two workshop at the point at one point, but that, that's not about all. So we started as a French French uh, DDR with a few a few people invited, but there were more and more experts that we wanted to discuss with, so it, we said we wanted people from abroad, from Germany, from Italy, from uh, CERN, from uh, the UK. So we, dec we decided that when the first four years were uh, over, we wanted to go to uh, Euro GDR. <coughs> So again, uh, there was a big scientific committee with uh, big names uh, into it, uh, Pierre, for, it was, uh, but you see lots of people, very well known people in the field and some, uh, some, some of them are here. So the, the, the Eurogia turned into one big plenary meeting, usually abroad, and uh, maybe some other topical meeting during the year. So the first meeting took place in Aachen in 2001, and then they were meeting in Durham, in uh, Orsay, and uh, in Frascati. And there were four, those four working groups were formed that reflects the, the, the kind of hot topics of the, of the time. Um, so after these two periods serving as a chairman of the GDR, um, and Pierre stepped down and, uh, and gave the token to uh, Jean, who will be talking uh, very soon. And uh, the GDR still remains under the name GDR Terrascale up to this date. And Pierre participating in those uh, various inc incarnations of the GDR uh, all, all along. So beyond just the science that was done at the GDR, at the GDR we've been together for such a long time that we became kind of friends. It was a time to, a time to have a beer, a, a banquet, etc. So um, one of those occasions were partly memorable. I, th I think even uh, 20 years after, I still remember this, <laughs> this, very, bank this very night. Um, it was a banquet after the, uh, well, right in the middle of the meeting in Montpellier in 1998, which took place in a nice, in a nice place uh, just among the wine, wine line, and the Mass de Saporta. And so, so you can read French, it says Maison du Vin. So just for the name in front of the building, you knew that the, this banquet is going to be memorable. <laughs> And in fact, the, the wine was flowing, flowing, flowing for, for hours and hours. And people start to be a little happy, happy and happier, and a bit weird. And uh, it turned out that I think it was also Pierre's birthday at the time, so he enjoyed the night. But still, uh, as a chairman of the GDR, he had to give the final talk. But for the final talk, he had difficulty just to stand. So... What he did to stand is just to grab a bottle that's standing on the table, and this, just to steady him, he was giving his talk and slightly os oscillating, maybe. <laughs> but still, he, he delivered his talk. I think uh, I, I see the smile in the, in, in the room from people who were there. It was really something that is completely crazy. Crazy night. And of course, it was in the middle of the, the, the GDR uh, workshop, so there was a meeting in, in the next morning. And in the next morning, everyone, almost everyone, including Jean-Francois, had a very hard time following the morning session. Another recollection from Jean-Francois, more personal, is when, when Jean-Francois sort of, quote-unquote, retired, because it was in, 
2010, but he's still around. <laughs> uh, we organized a, a fest for Jean-Francois Fest for him. And it was a fest, and it's not really very serious. No, not, not talk about really a lot of physics, but sharing the good memories of Jean-Francois. And Pierre gave a talk, looking very serious, but uh, he has put it in a, a, a few of the jokes uh, for Jean-Francois, uh, some, uh, say, how can you reduce the tension between, he started physics, so there was tension between the, you know, the electric scale and, uh, and the, the fact that we didn't have discovered the X, etc., blah, blah, blah. Uh, so he said, can we realize to Z at the level of prions, or he called us, uh, environmental uh, breaking, and then a more directly uh, kidding uh, Jean-Francois, he said that there are two states of Jean-Francois, and he may oscillate from one state to the other during the banquet. Uh, one is bosonic stake and one is uh, fermionic stake, and this is the kind of people he was. You know, could, we could talk seriously about physics. He could talk also. He could also give uh, uh, funny talks with a very straight face. And this brings another memory. Uh, there's lots of banquet in uh, Jean-François slide, so you can you can see that there's something important for him and maybe for Pierre. Uh, this uh, another equation of uh, another banquet in 2003 which I think was part of the GDR, and uh, where you can see, uh, of course, Pierre Bottles and uh, Fabiola. Fabiola Gianotti sends uh, our regrets that uh, she cannot be here, but she wanted to send a message uh, to us and send a message to Pierre. So she says that Pierre was not only a great scientist, but was also a very, kind, uh, very special person. Above all, I remember his modesty and his unique ways of making everyone feel at ease with scientific discussion, and he attracted people to him as a magnet. So, so many times when I was confronted with problems in, in my work in uh, Aleph or Atlas, I told myself I should discuss this with Pierre. And that's, I think I'm, even me personally, uh, I, I remember saying su such things. Um, so for me, he was a reference. In the Suzy GDR, he, he pioneered a way of bringing the theoretical and experimental community together to discuss the available experimental results and the theoretical ideas and develop strategies for the future. So beyond the impact, on actual, uh, impact of supersymmetry, that activity be became a template for how experimental and theoretical physicists should work together. And it was successfully uh, adopted uh, in many other initiatives. So this was the recollection from uh, Fabiola. And I uh, will end with another picture of Banquet. Uh, again, it was quite a long time ago, but you can see again uh, Pierre, Fabiola, and Jean-Francois. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Merci. Donc je vais commencer par euh, vous lire le message de Christophe Grosjean qui... Euh, qui ne peut pas être là aujourd'hui, mais souhaitait néanmoins témoigner avec quelques souvenirs. On pourrait mentionner ce mois de mai 1999, où nous avons passé certains dimanches à Saclay à lire et comprendre le fameux papier Binetrui, défaillé et Langlois. Puis il fait le lien avec Randall Sundrum pour réconcilier les équations de Friedman avec l'existence de dimensions supplémentaires. Ces week-ends studieux ont certainement changé notre vie. Je me souviens aussi du mois d'avril-mai 2000, je venais d'avoir une offre du CEA et j'avais donc renoncé à me présenter au concours CNRS. Pierre était dans le comité, nous travaillions ensemble, il était venu à Berkeley quelques temps avant euh, et il m'avait donné rendez-vous à l'Institut Poincaré en fin de journée, après les auditions, pour discuter. J'avais croisé différents membres du comité qui se demandaient si j'avais changé d'avis et voulaient finalement tenter ma chance au CNRS et qui s'étonnait surtout que Pierre ait encore l'énergie pour discuter de physique après une longue journée de jury. Euh, je me souviens aussi des années 2004-2008, où nous avons travaillé ensemble au sein du comité du CNRS. 
Il m'a plusieurs fois dissuadé de jeter l'éponge et partir après des débats houleux et des décisions auxquelles je n'adhérais pas. Je me souviens aussi d'une longue discussion sur les ondes gravitationnelles en 2006. Après une journée d'audition CNRS, nous avions tous deux rendez-vous à l'autre bout de Paris et nous avons traversé la ville à pied en discutant de notre projet sur le fond stochastique d'ondes gravitationnelles produite par des transitions de phase autour de, de l'échelle du téraélectronvolt et la possibilité de les détecter avec l'ISA. Il était évidemment très intéressé. Voilà pour le, le témoignage de Christophe. Je vais, je vais juste faire un petit commentaire sur euh, ce fameux mois de mai 1999. Euh, en fait, c'était une période assez euh, folle. C'était au moment où le papier de Randall Sundrum était paru. Donc, c'était tout début mai 1999. Et en fait, le papier de, de Cédric, Pierre et, et David était, en fait, avait été soumis à 24 heures près, euh, enfin, complètement indépendamment. Euh, donc pour nous, le, ce papier de, de Cédric, Pierre et David était vraiment très intriguant puisque euh, il prédisait une cosmologie, une cosmologie très non standard euh, qui était en, en conflit avec, le, 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 par exemple, la, la nucléosynthèse primordiale. Et donc Christophe, moi, et en collaboration avec Jim Klein, on avait passé tout notre mois de mai à, à essayer de, de comprendre ces deux papiers, celui de Randall Sundrum, afin de voir comment les réconcilier, puisque le, le modèle de Randall Sundrum en fait, prédisait une, une gravité quatre-dimensionnelle euh, tout en étant compatible donc, avec ces modèles avec dimension supplémentaire et prédisait donc une gravité quatre-dimensionnelle. Donc, les équations de Friedman devaient être euh, standards au moins dans la limite où la densité d'énergie de l'univers était euh, en dessous de l'échelle du, du, du Tera électronvolt. Voilà, donc en fait, tous ces papiers ont été euh, euh, les premiers d'une longue série... Euh, de travaux euh, sur la phénoménologie des modèles avec dimension supplémentaire. Toute cette période 1999-2001 avait été une période très excitante euh, qui était reliée donc à l'exploration de la physique euh, avec des modèles avec dimension supplémentaire. Il y avait une, une marée de, de papiers avec des, des idées nouvelles toutes les semaines. C'était une période assez stimulante pour, pour l'étudiante en thèse que j'étais à l'époque. Euh, voilà. Christophe a aussi retrouvé cette photo euh, dans ses archives. Euh, C'était une photo qui a été prise euh, euh, lors du dîner euh, d'anniversaire de Carlos Savoie en, en 2006. Voilà. Euh, donc, nombre de témoignages aujourd'hui proviennent de, de ses anciens collègues et collaborateurs. Et pour ma, mar pour ma part, je souhaitais en fait euh, souligner le rôle qu'il a joué auprès des étudiants. Donc, il a enseigné la théorie quantique des champs à plusieurs générations d'étudiants français. Enfin, la, le cours de théorie quantique des champs, mais aussi le cours de, de physique du modèle standard, euh, des théories électrofaibles. Donc, il, est, il était extrêmement apprécié des étudiants. Il avait un excellent contact et il a été une source d'inspiration pour, pour beaucoup. Euh, et je voulais souligner en particulier son rôle en tant que directeur du DEA CPM euh, à Orsay. En fait, c'est dans ce contexte que je, je l'ai rencontré, puisque j'étais euh, élève de, de la première promotion 97-98. Euh, en fait, j'ai été véritablement bluffée par euh, l'implication de Pierre et Yves Charon. Euh, en fait, il oui, faut que j'explique je, 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 le contexte. En 1997, Pierre, euh, Pierre et, et Yves Charon ont pris la relève de, de Luc Valentin pour diriger le DEA-CPM. Euh, et euh, ce qui m'avait vraiment impressionné, c'était leur, leur implication dans cette formation et l'intérêt qu'ils portaient aux étudiants. Donc à l'époque, quand on candidatait à ce DEA, euh, il y avait un entretien, euh, un entretien d'embauche. Euh, ils organisaient des sessions les samedis de, 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 du mois d'avril pour rencontrer les candidats euh, et tester leur motivation. Euh, et, et je me souviens du, de, de, de ce jour de rentrée, début septembre 1997. Euh, en fait, Pierre et, et Yves connaissaient déjà tous les étudiants par cœur. Euh, ils connaissaient leur prénom, leur nom, leur, leur CV. Et on s'était dit qu'ils avaient dû euh, apprendre par cœur le trombinoscope. Ils avaient passé le mois d'août à apprendre le trombinoscope par cœur euh, avant, de, avant la rentrée. Et en fait, ça a été comme ça pendant toute l'année scolaire. Euh, ils ont vraiment eu une très grande attention pour le devenir de chacun de, des étudiants de cette promotion. On se sentait un peu comme, leur, comme, comme leurs enfants. Euh, ils étaient absolument euh, 
très attentionné et toujours prêt à, à nous conseiller. Euh, et en effet, cette année a été vraiment euh, très importante pour moi, puisque c'est une année charnière où, où on choisit son, sa thèse pendant l'année du DEA. Et donc, je ne serais pas là où je suis aujourd'hui si je n'avais pas croisé Pierre, en fait, euh, à ce moment clé dans mon parcours. Donc, il m'a conforté dans, dans mes choix et il m'a donné vraiment confiance. Euh, à l'époque, la, la communauté en, en physique théorique à l'interface phénoménologie des particules et cosmologie était relativement limitée. Euh, et donc, il y avait un choix limité de directeur de thèse. Euh, Pierre était déjà pris, euh, il avait déjà Cédric en tant qu'étudiant, il n'était pas libre. Euh, mais il m'a mis en contact avec les bonnes personnes. Et c'est ainsi que j'ai fini par faire ma thèse euh, à Saclay avec Carlos Savoie. Donc voilà pour l'aspect euh, contact avec les étudiants. Je voulais aussi euh, dire à nouveau quelques mots au sujet de ce fameux GDR, euh, qui a été une opportunité pour les étudiants, euh, donc dans cette fin des années 90, début des années 2000, donc les années euh, post-LEP. Euh, ça, ça a été une occasion pour les étudiants vraiment de faire la connaissance avec toute la communauté française, en particulier la communauté des expérimentateurs. Et je me souviens de ces GDR très animés qui sont restés dans la mémoire de, de, nombreux, de nombreuses personnes ici. Et plus tard, c'est via les réunions du Working Group sur la cosmologie avec Lisa que, que je l'ai côtoyé. Donc la dernière fois, c'était en octobre 2016. Il était venu au workshop sur les ondes gravitationnelles qu'on avait organisé à Daisy. Et il avait donné un, un très beau colloquium, euh, très, très enthousiaste. Et il semblait très en forme. Donc, je pense qu'on lui doit vraiment beaucoup d'avoir joué un, un rôle majeur dans, dans l'application de la France euh, dans le projet LISA. Donc, pour conclure, euh, donc je pense à l'avalanche de messages incrédules qui ont été échangés euh, euh, dans notre communauté le, le jour de l'annonce de sa disparition. Euh, hier soir, je relisais les, les messages. Euh, et donc, pour conclure mon, mon intervention, je vais, je vais citer... Euh, un email que j'avais, je vais me permettre de citer un email échangé avec euh, Chiara Caprini, dans lequel Chiara écrivait la phrase suivante. « La dernière fois que je l'ai vue à une réunion, Lisa, à la PC, il y avait un problème de projecteur. L'image était là, mais la couleur avait tourné au rose. Et Pierre a dit à ce moment-là, c'est bien comme ça, il faut voir la vie en rose. » Voilà. Merci. Uh, first of all, thanks for the organizers of organizing this event. I think uh, it's deeply felt as uh, something necessary for the be be bewilderment that we all lived in the disappearance of Pierre. Um, I have the impression that if you try to do good science teaching uh, and organization, somehow in France you cannot help but walk in the path of uh, Pierre uh, Binetru. He's been doing uh, all sorts of uh, incredible achievements that are really uh, um, felt and uh, that were really, uh, really helpful. Um, I, I want to, uh, of course, start by uh, mentioning this GDR that has been very well described, but just uh, sharing with you the impressions as a uh, organizer participant of uh, some sessions and uh, also with a look back of uh, what it really meant uh, putting up some, such a structure. Uh, what Pierre did so between the, on the period 97-204 was to make use of a, a brand new CNRS structure, which was this GDR, and um, he didn't have any fear to cope with uh, an uncharted uh, bureaucratic territory and jungle that can be pretty heavy, and uh, when you have a new structure, you don't know where it's going to be. And uh, it, it, it was, I, I can imagine, an, an enormous effort on, on, on his part, which he did without any hesitation. Um, he obtained really substantial financial support for realizing this, and uh, it, it allowed uh, to create uh, something really massive. Um, it's really impressive the, the collective movement that was achieved in this, uh, on this topic in France. Um, you had both theorists, which, as you know, are rather fermionic as people. It's hard to put them all together and uh, discuss and uh, share. 
And also experimentalists, as, um, as uh, Laurent was mentioning, across uh, the uh, collaboration barriers, that were having a really wide spectrum of, uh, of interest. Um, you could have really follow the, 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 the progresses, both on the experimental side, on the phenomenological, on theoretical model building, in a whole uh, spectrum of uh, interests. And I, I feel that many people were really eager to get this wide view uh, all in one. Uh, in a sense, uh, you could see that Susie was just a kind of, uh, I mean, of course, it's a beautiful theory, but uh, with retrospect, it was also a, a, an excellent uh, case for uh, uh, looking at the whole uh, of physics as a whole from the experimental cosmological. There were links that Susie was able to draw between these uh, different activities and that made people uh, interested in across all these uh, disciplines. Um, of course, it created a, a quite uh, lively scientific environment, as Geraldine was uh, reminding. Um, even for the smallest labs in France, I mean, what, what really strikes me is that it was a national collective effort and uh, that, uh, that was useful for a uh, PhD student uh, everywhere. They, they had a home and uh, a place to discuss and get uh, presentations and get uh, remarks, uh, discuss half-baked ideas, and this is really uh, very good. Um, so somehow there was a real pride and uh, belonging spirit to this uh, GDR, and as was mentioned, the, the, the post-banquet uh, mornings, uh, one thing they have to know is that uh, or session leaders were supposed to uh, summarize the parallel sessions uh, that had been taken the day before. And usually that was happening on the Friday or, I mean, the last day after the banquet morning, which, I mean, how do you get people after a banquet to uh, sit together and uh, make their summaries. I mean, you need to have really some persuasive uh, power or commitment feeling, and that was there. I mean, people were happy to do that in some way. Um, also, I think that uh, it has been mentioned how uh, kind and listening Pierre was uh, in all his uh, interactions with, with scientists. Um, I think that the way he managed to uh, direct this GDR was something which you could, could say is uh, some, some sort of soft power. Somehow, I, I, I can't remember any time saying, him saying, uh, you have to do this, you must do that, or uh, he, he would say uh, rather something like, uh, this would be best, don't you think? I mean, and just evidence goes for uh, instead of uh, hierarchy, and this is I think very uh, successful, part of the successful of this uh, um, movement he created. And I remember, I, 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 um, I want to uh, stress again, it was very original in its scope and uh, amplitude. Now, um, I, I'm supposed to speak about uh, what happened next because uh, uh, I, I took over uh, in 205. Uh, well, Pierre managed to convince me I might be able to take over from his mother of all GDRs by the time some other had been created. And um, uh, that was not an easy task because I couldn't see how I could uh, do as well as uh, half as well as I, uh, he was doing. And um, what's really striking is that he helped us, of course, to prepare the reports and close uh, his uh, term. But he let us uh, full freedom to organize uh, the future and didn't put uh, pressure as uh, the previous uh, director on how to do things. He was uh, ready to answer, but he left um, complete uh, freedom to uh, find the best course for the following. Um, so, yeah, building on the, the, this, the successful experience that he created, I managed to keep the, the, the GIA going on for uh, four years, and uh, uh, I didn't manage to, to keep the same budget that uh, Pierre managed to, to uh, collect, but uh, 
the thing went on, and okay, as, as was said, uh, the GDR Suzy became Terra Scale in 2009, up to now, with uh, Dirk Zervas and Gilbert Multaka uh, in, uh, um, in, in, in charge. And uh, it's clear that Pierre identified a, a clear need in the community, and uh, he managed to create an appropriate answer which uh, is still uh, very appropriate 20 years later. So this is quite an achievement. Um, I want to uh, share another uh, uh, side aspect uh, concerning teaching and uh, organization. He was very busy in 98. He organized also a school in Carges uh, entitled Flavor Engage Hierarchies. Uh, he was truly happy there. I mean, you could see he was enjoying a lot, both uh, the place, uh, the, the friends, and the scientific uh, professor. There, there was a super program, really. Um, and uh, I have two anecdotes to share with, about that, because it shows, uh, I mean, how deep he was ready to put uh, his hand in the complications. Uh, you, at the time, there were not that many uh, cash uh, machines in conferences, so you had to, uh, you had to collect money, but uh, the cash machines were in the village, and uh, you had to pay down at the institute, which means that everybody was bringing his uh, about 2,000 uh, French francs along, and there were 70 students. So that means about 140 kilo French francs that you have to carry back to the bank in uh, in some uh, in some uh, suitcase. Uh, now this is Corsica. Uh, it was in '98. Uh, the bank was just next door, the house of uh, Ivan Colonna, if the name rings a bell. <laughs> but okay, he did it, no problem. And, uh, <laughs> um, so uh, I, I want to share an another uh, uh, well anecdote uh, in the sense that uh, he, I mean it's clear we, we, you saw how, mu how much he achieved in in all aspects. I'm mentioning here organization aspects, but it's clear also that um, he was totally uh, not doing that for self interestment um, as a, as part of the Conseil National des Universités, who is uh, in charge of uh, evaluating the promotion uh, of some uh, applicants. Uh, I was surprised that I didn't see his file for uh, the highest uh, degree, uh, which is uh, Classe Exceptionnelle 2, uh, for some time. And I was wondering, well, I mean, OK, he's ready. There's no way. So I asked him once, uh, why, why don't you uh, apply? Oh, I, I don't know. What's the date? Uh, I know I have no time. And OK, so it took a, a couple of years before I managed to get him uh, put his file, and of course it went directly. But it's just to show that everybody knows that. It's clear from when, you, when you know him, but it, it, he was really doing all these great things, not for himself, but for what it can uh, mean for us as a collective uh, uh, scientific community. So uh, as a conclusion, I, I, I feel I haven't finished paying back the tribute I owe to the French community and uh, mostly uh, the way Pierre managed to organize it. And uh, certainly it doesn't help uh, to uh, the feeling of loss that, uh, that I discovered with his brutal disappearance, at least to me. So I, like everybody, I'll be missing him very much. and. Uh, I'll continue to try and uh, um, act the way he was uh, uh, showing in, in, in this collective uh, type of achievements that I think are really important in, in France nowadays. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to thank the organizers for putting on this memorial for Pierre. It's very hard to speak. Um, Pierre was a fantastic person. I'm not going to talk much about his science or about my collaboration with him. Well, not on physics, anyway. Um, I think Pierre and I overlapped when we were both at CERN 
but I kind of knew him then, but I didn't really know him. And I didn't get to know Pierre until about 20 years ago when we met at a meeting in Piresk. Um, and we've been friends ever since. Um, we kind of clicked. We talked about physics. We talked about politics. We talked about life. Um, and I should say that whilst we talk quite a bit about physics, we only wrote one paper together. Um, so Pierre was a very much a very kind person, a very generous and inclusive person. So, you know, he'd like to bring people in and share. Um, always wanting to share with others. Um, you know, very thoughtful of the other people. We've already heard this. I guess I'm just repeating what everyone else has said. Um, and, you know, Pierre, of course, over the years, uh, Professor Dorsey, he was really, really busy, as many of us are. But, you know, when it comes down to it, he always seemed to make time. Um, hey, let's go to dinner spend the whole evening as though he had time. You never felt that you were being, oh no, I've got to go and get on with this now. He had time for you. And dinner with Pierre was fun. It wasn't just, oh, let's go and have something, then we can go home. No, it's real fun. Um, and he was very careful about this because he took you to someone nice, made sure that they could cater for one's weird diet, and it was great. We talked about everything. Um, and I think probably my daughter, I, by, by the time I met Pierre, I was a lone parent, I think my daughter was probably about 10 um, when Pierre met her. Every time I met Pierre subsequently, he would always ask after her. Not, oh, how's your daughter, but how's Tara? What's she doing? He knew her name. Um, and, you know, most people just don't remember those details or don't think about it. Um, so Pierre was very keen to invite me into the initiatives he had. He always wanted to include me. Um, friendship, supporting a woman physicist. I thought he had a very good example in his PhD advisor. I don't really know, um, but I was invited into the GDR. Um, my claim to being working on supersymmetry was really a paper on supersymmetric cosmic strings. Um, but Okay, so I was interested in the field of astroparticle physics and cosmology, so I did, I suppose, fit in. I think I learnt far more than I brought. Um, it was great fun. And he invited my student along as well, which he didn't have to, you know, but bring him along. Um, I'm not going to go into the GDR because you've heard it all. It's just that the meetings were inclusive, they combined a hell of a lot of physics, brought a lot of people, different people together, cohorts, and they were great fun. As well as being, you know, professional learning things and giving talks. Um, he was, he had this real enthusiasm and he could, you know, his enthusiasm was just infectious. And it brought together people and they followed. As um, Jean had just said, he didn't say do this. He said, wouldn't it be good if we did? And yes, it would be good if we did. So one did it. Um, Pierre obviously was passionate about physics. He had the, he always had his eye on the bigger picture. He had real vision not just looking, for example, at the physics of a scalar field rolling down a potential, thinking, oh, it gives an accelerating universe. How does this fit in with actual particle physics models? 
supersymmetry breaking. You know, he was one of these people who could see that you don't just have a toy model, you put it into the context of particle physics and the real world. Again, the vision he had a while ago now with Elisa and spending real time on that. Um, and of course, the vision that he had when he was at Orsay and there was a possibility of building a whole new lab in this new university in this site called Tobiak that when he was telling me about it, I didn't even know where it was. Um, but, you know, he was telling me, oh, yes, I, I'm, there's this possibility. I'm going to go and see the site. I'm going to meet with the director. I'm going to meet with this person, with that person. And he was telling me all about this at a time when this was in its infancy. It was just a little vision. And some years down the line, the vision became a reality. Not just a reality that he created this lab, but a reality that with Pierre's enthusiasm, he persuaded the brightest and the best of the young things at the time to join him, to just uproot themselves from where they were and come. And here they are. Um, that's no mean feat, because you've got to uproot yourself, even if it is in the same city. Um, for me, I still can't believe that Pierre has passed. The last time I saw him was in September 16. I was doing a PhD exam for his student, Maurizio, who's here. And we had lunch together. We talked about physics. We talked about politics. We talked, no, Brexit on the one hand and the fact that you had presidential elections on the other and the possibilities for both and outcomes. And we talked you know, how each of us were doing. He had so much vitality and so much energy. And he was telling me that he had this fellowship that allowed him to spend time in Berkeley. And he was looking forward to going to Berkeley in the winter. And it seems so unreal that come the march, he had died. When I look back, I know that he had lost weight, but I didn't think anything of it. I should have done. So Pierre was really an inspiration to many of us, a supporter of many of us, who gave so much to our community. And we all miss him. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, let me start by um, thanking organizers. Uh, it's uh, an honor to, to, to present, to be here. Um, Pierre was a great collaborator. It was an extra, extraordinary experience uh, to collaborate with him, a uh, great person. And um, so I will present a scientific talk, sort of, uh, <clears throat> based on some uh, new ideas given that Pierre was extremely open-minded about new ideas, I think he would like it. Uh, so, the, um, <clears throat> so the idea is to, to understand the extraordinary capacity of uh, information storage, uh, memory storage, by, by black holes in terms of uh, the neural networks. So the idea is that the, the way black holes uh, store uh, information, uh, the underlying mechanism, uh, goes well beyond gravity, and there are other systems of nature, uh, maybe even our brain, that uses this uh, underlying mechanism of uh, memory storage. Now, to, to, as a first step to, to, to go in this direction is to, to try to understand a black hole as a, as a, as a neural network, okay? Uh, how does this work? Oh, uh, yeah. Now, um, let me explain what, what, what do I mean under enhanced capacity of memory storage. Uh, I will focus on energy efficiency of this capacity. 
Um, in this talk, I will not focus on the algorithms or anything like that. So the question is energy efficiency of uh, memory storage. Now, the way physical systems store uh, memory, I mean store patterns in their memory, is they store patterns in, in their states. So the system has a state and it stores some pattern. And you have some characteristics of these states. Uh, you have certain readers which can recognize this, these uh, characteristics. And so this could be written in terms of uh, numbers, a set of numbers. Uh, and then the, the, the question that interests me is, uh, what is the, 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 the memory capacity in terms of the pattern storage in, in a given energy gap? So uh, I, I will be interested, because this is a motivation from black holes, uh, I'll be interested in, in the systems in which the memory capacity is maximal, so that systems can store a maximal number of patterns within an infinitesimal energy gap. And also, they can rearrange these patterns at low energy cost, so, which means that, uh, and translated in terms of physics, the physical degrees of freedom, we are looking for systems with high microstate entropy and high and the, and the gapless modes, uh, a large number of the gapless modes. Now, motivation is obvious. Uh, it's, it's, it's extremely important both for uh, artificial designs and artificial intelligence, etc. and black holes. Uh, I'm a particle physicist, so I want to understand how general is this underlying mechanism of information storage viewed from particle physicist's point of view. Um, now, um, so this also gives uh, some interesting uh, idea of understanding neural networks, translating neural networks uh, backwards <laughs> as quantum field theory systems, okay? As we'll see. Now, uh, one, uh, one uh, correspondence that we'll, we'll discover is that um, uh, the enhanced memory ca capacity state in a, in a neural network, once we translate it as a quantum field system, corresponds to a critical state of uh, uh, high of large mi microstate entropy. Okay. Now, uh, the description that uh, I will use, because uh, as usual, as a particle physicist, I I'm using an effective description. If you give me a system. For me, for me the, the first question, uh, as for all of us here, uh, is what are the uh, proper degrees of freedom of this system? Uh, and then we translate these degrees of freedom as, as quantum oscillators. Uh, and uh, what are the interaction rules between these uh, between these different degrees of freedom? So for neural network, this is some kind of uh, synaptic connection between them. Okay. So then there is a natural dictionary. So if you have a um, uh, quantum field, uh, I will identify the qu quantum field theoretic system, in this particular case, as a black hole. Uh, so one assumption that I will make in my talk, that black holes are quantum field theoretic systems, okay? Um, and, um, but here I'm not necessarily focusing on, on a black hole, any quantum field theoretic system. If I want to translate it as a neural network, I, I will do identification that the momentum modes uh, of, the, of the quantum field, uh, I will identify, I will represent as ne neurons uh, uh, mentally. Um, and um, Hamiltonian interactions between these the different degrees of freedom in the Hamiltonian as uh, synaptic connections, okay? As I said, I will be interested mostly in the, the energetics of the process and dynamics of the process. Uh, then the, the excitation level of a given neuron will be um, uh, characterized by the occupation number of, a, of an oscillator. Okay? So that is a very clear dictionary. Now, why this is interesting also, even if you don't care about black holes, um, it's, this is interesting because this, uh, this type of identification of visualizing neural networks as quantum fields uh, also is interesting for both uh, sides because it brings something, a sense of geometry and locality in the, in the system which is intrinsically non-local, such as neural network, okay? Um, so it is clear because once you identify this with the um, momentum modes or angular momentum modes of the field, uh, normally when we write down interactions among fields, they, we write them down as local in the position space. 
for, for the good reason. But in the momentum space, interaction of the fields are, of course, highly non-local. And so they literally interact like, like a neural network. OK, very good. So now, so the question is, can we learn a lesson from, 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 from black holes? In other words, if I do the following uh, thought experiment, uh, if I design a neural network which has very naive uh, gravitational properties, what will happen? Will this neural network all of a sudden acquire an exponential capacity of memory storage or not? And as we will see, it will acquire exponen exponential memory capacity storage, okay? Now, uh, so what do we know about black holes? So I will only use very fundamental facts about black holes that they, they, they are not controversial. So everybody agrees on that. I'm not gonna start like writing quantum gravity Lagrangians, et cetera, et cetera. So what do we know about black holes? We know that they carry entropy. Uh, the entropy scales like area uh, in Planck units. So it, it creates an impression that a black hole, and this was noticed by Toh, Saskind, and others, uh, uh, Witten and others also in ADS-CFT correspondence uh, context, that the impression is that as if uh, there are uh, pixels you know, on, the, on the surface of a black hole, and each Planck pixel houses a degree of freedom, which can be, let's say, in two states, zero, one. Or... But we don't know who these degrees of freedom are, okay, where they come from, uh, and they have extraordinary properties because they occupy essentially a zero gap. And they are, so these are enormous number of gapless degrees of freedom which inhabit a surface, okay? So this is bottom line. Um, now, the number of patterns, therefore, is enormous that black hole can store within essentially a zero energy gap. So <laughs> energy gap, H bar divided by R, if you have a black hole the size R, the, within this energy gap, H bar divided by R, black hole stores exponentially large number of patterns, okay? That's a fact. That's, there's nothing to this, it just follows from Bekenstein entropy. Um, so th that's why, I mean, if you, if you look at the, at the black hole, let's say if you take a solar mass black hole, classically for you it's just one black hole, but in reality it comes with a label, a quantum label, which we cannot, cannot resolve classically, and this label takes exponentially large possible values, okay? Now, this is extraordinary because if you take a, if you compare a black hole with a normal box, okay, to store, let's say, one bit of information in a normal box would require already this energy, h bar divided by r. And instead, black hole stores in this gap, the normal box would require, uh, for one bit, uh, exponentially large number of patterns, okay? So how, so the question is, how black hole manages to deliver such an, such an enormous number of, of gapless modes, who are these gapless modes, where they're coming from, and um, Y area, okay? So I will not offer any quantum gravity explanation of this, okay, of this uh, phenomena. I don't want to go there. So I will just use, I will do the following. I will only use the facts that we, are, we know about black holes that are true. Then I will have two observers. And I will ask one observer to do to, to, to list these facts, known facts about black holes, and then I will ask another observer to implement this in neural networks and see what happens, okay? And something quite interesting will happen, as you will see. So the first, uh, first physicist is Alice, first observer is Alice, and I, so I will do the following thing. I'll give Alice an imaginary box, okay, so of certain size R, so this is the system for her, quantum field theoretic system, and ask her to store as many patterns as possible in this, in this box, okay? So now, of course, Alice is a quantum field theory person, so she uses as degrees of freedom uh, particles, uh, excitations of particles, different momentum modes. Now, uh, to, to store patterns in an empty box is extremely costly in energy. Uh, for instance, to, to, to store, to go from zero to one, from zero, zero, zero to one, one, zero, zero, she already needs to invest the entire energy that black hole requires for exponentially large number of patterns, okay? So she, Alice sees that to, to store patterns near the, the vacuum, 
uh, is extremely costly in energy. Okay, so next thing I, I ask Alice, to start populating the lowest possible mode in the box. So put, to start putting soft particles in the box and see what happens. Now, for a while, nothing happens, of course. Uh, this, the, the energy cost essentially is unchanged. But then there is a dramatic uh, transition, as we know very well. So once Alice puts the number of uh, soft modes, which is equal to a would-be entropy of a black hole, and by the way, this, this is a fact, an interesting fact, which is often is sort of forgotten. By the way, this is equal to the inverse gravitational interaction strength of the mode. So it's like once you populate the, the, the particle, uh, the, to the occupation number of particle, once you make the inverse of its gravitational coupling, a miracle happens. Now, this miracle is, uh, so Alice will form a black hole. She knows nothing how this happens quantum mechanically. She doesn't have to know quantum gravity or anything like that. But it just, she just records the experimental fact. So the black hole is formed, and once, of course, once black hole is, is formed, the, 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 the enormous number of gapless modes emerge. And this is the usual story. So now we have this old Bekenstein entropy, etc. Okay. So um, Alice stops here, okay, and then she just reports to Bob, another physicist, that, that's experimenting with neural networks, and asks him to repeat the same thing with neural networks. Now, no quantum gravity, n n nothing like that, just neural networks. So what Bob has to do, has to design a neural network, the extremely naive uh, neural network with gravity-like synaptic connections, okay? And then look for the states in this neural network when the softest neurons are excited to a certain critical level. And the guideline is the, they should be excited to inverse of their synaptic strength, okay? So extremely weak connections and high level of occupation. This is the guideline. And actually, the same thing happens as in, what happens in black holes, as we'll see in a moment. Now, what, what is the essence of the, of the mechanism? Is the following. Now, think about the generic neural network, okay, of gravity-like in that sense, okay? Gravity-like means that the synaptic connections are attractive. I will elaborate more, a little bit more, in, in one, after one page. But they are extremely weak, so these gravity synaptic connections. Now, I will divide mentally these neurons into two sets, okay, Z and Y, and uh, I will call Zs the master neurons, because those are the ones that I choose, to be, which are the softest ones, and those I want to populate to the highest possible level, okay? Then you see what happens. What happens is that every time you excite a Z neuron, excitation of Y neuron becomes cheaper. So effective gap of excitation of Y neuron decreases because of negative energy synaptic connections, okay? So what happens is that the effective gap of a J neuron, Y neuron, of, diminishes like this. And there is a critical state where once you excite Z neurons to this type of particular uh, occupation numbers, the, the y, uh, y neurons become gapless. And all of a sudden, uh, the network acquires exponential capacity of memory storage, okay? Now, let's see in, in more details uh, how far the analogy with uh, black holes goes, okay? Now, of course, in the previous discussion, I didn't assume any symmetry. I assumed that, okay, these synaptic connections are completely random, okay? But if we also have s some symmetries, then situation can change even more, it can become even more dramatic because, as for instance, one master neuron can make a lot of other neurons coupless because of the symmetry of the synaptic connections, as we'll see in a second, okay? Now, here is what Bob does as a most naive implementation of gravity-like synaptic connections in the neural network, okay? So, what is the idea? The idea is that, okay, Bob says, okay, let me, let me imitate gravity. How can I imitate gravity? Gravity interaction is neg energetically negative, so it's attractive, okay? So excitation of one neuron <laughs> makes excitation of the other neuron energetically favorable. And let me put the, the, the strength of the connection proportional to the thresholds of their excitations, just like sort of a Newton's law translated in neural network language. 
Okay, so this is the point. So this is so these are neurons. They have these are the thresholds, and uh, W is the operator. Of course, we are in quantum theory. This is uh, and um, uh, the important thing is the first term. So the, the the strength is proportional to the to the product of their synaptic connections. The second term is just for to make the Hamiltonian bounded from below. Just serves only that purpose. Okay, epsilon star is a parameter. Um, and um, what are C's? C's, these coefficients, C's are the, the coefficients that carry uh, the information about the uh, symmetry structure of your network, okay? So now, depending what kind of symmetry you want to propose for this, for the synaptic connections, so you have to implement this symmetry through this coefficient C, okay? Now, uh, I will put the simplest possibility, spherical symmetry. Spherical symmetry in D dimensions, in some D dimensions, okay? So, well, you realize this through the usual spherical harmonics. So, Ys are uh, usual spherical harmonics. Uh, as you know, they are labeled by the set of D numbers in D integers. They satisfy these relations. This is just a generalization of normal spherical harmonics in for D dimensions, okay? Um, Ys are, again, values of the Laplace operator on a sphere. Um, and they have degeneracy of eigenvalue degeneracy, which scales as the highest weight, K of D, in power D minus 1. Now, now, I will introduce this notation, and this allows me to translate the neural network as a quantum field Hamiltonian. Okay? Now, if you don't like, if you don't, if you don't care about neural networks, just, just forget what I said uh, until now. This is a Hamiltonian of a quantum field that lives in D dimensions. Explicitly, there is no gravity here. This Hamiltonian uh, describes this field psi. No relativistic, by the way, okay? Which is even more surprising. Uh, and uh, uh, so, yeah, the, there is an attractive interaction. This is what, is, what matters. There is an attract attractive interaction which depends on the uh, momentum. So the momentum-dependent attractive interaction. So that's sort of the flavor of gravity uh, for this uh, field. Um, okay, so this is the Hamiltonian. By the way, uh, so th there are infinite number of Hamiltonians that you can write down with this property. So I just chose one be because I had to choose something to, to discuss. Um, but there are many different choices, okay? What matters is this ingredient, that there is an attractive momentum-dependent interaction, okay? Now, uh, then let's show that uh, this Hamiltonian gives you, uh, has the, the, the continuum of states, okay, parameterized by occupation number of the softest neuron, of the so softest mode. Now you don't have to call it neuron anymore if you, if you don't want to. Uh, each of them carrying uh, area low entropy, okay? So there are emergent number of gapless modes for each of them, and the, 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 their number scales like area. They inhabit D minus one dimension. Okay, uh, now the simplest to do this is in large n limit. So large n scaling just makes things exact. So we can do now analysis exact. Uh, so we, we, we populate, so the, the control parameter is the excitation level of the lowest, of the, of the softest mode, here is A0. So we take this um, large. And then if you, if you take double scaling limit, you make, this is sort of reminiscent of Toft's large n limit in QCD, large color. However, you have to be careful because the number of colors is characteristics of the theory. Here, n is characteristics of a state in a given theory. There are infinite number of states, and I go from state to state, okay? Um, so then what happens is that the modes uh, in this limit, the modes, uh, mode depending on n, they become exactly coupless. So this is the Hamiltonian in this limit. Actually, in this limit, Ham Hamiltonian uh, simplifies a, a lot. And you can see that for each n, there is one critical level which becomes gapless, okay? And it gives you an uh, enormous number of gapless modes uh, with the entropy that scales like area. So the number of gapless modes scales like area of D minus one dimensional sphere. So here's your holography. So this is a theory 
of this is the simplest model I know. Actually, I've never seen in literature anything like that, which, mani which is manifestly holographic, and you can follow this exactly by, uh, in large n limits. Okay. Um, so, uh, the um, so this is the entropy. Now, of course, you can take this gapless mode and you can store exponentially large number of patterns. In, in these modes, obviously. There's not, nothing surprising about that, okay? Uh, so once I have this mi microstate entropy that scales like area, of course, immediately I get exponential enhanced capacity of pattern storage, okay? Um, in fact, the pattern storage, in fact, in large n limit is even divergent because this diverges like n, where n is the maximal excitation level you want to allow, okay? Um, but uh, actually, this, this divergence is not important because if you want to count number, microstates, uh, mi microstates, you should limit yourself by small n because when, once little n become large, they are no longer microstates of the same classical macrostate. They become independent classical states. So you should not count them. Okay? But this is just a side-by remark. You can still use them for pattern storage. No problem, of course. Okay, so now, let, let, let's see, so what are we witnessing here, okay? So again, let me reiterate. I don't make any assumption about quantum gravity. I just, I only use the fact that in gravity, we have this holographic type behavior, uh, a black hole, uh, entropy scaling like area. And um, then we design the most naive, um, neural network, or equivalently, a most naive quantum field. Again, I want to insist that this is full legitimate quantum field theory, non-relativistic, with the gravity-like interaction, okay? It's not gravity, it's just gravity-like interaction. Um, and we, we, we discovered that this theory uh, has exponential enhancement of memory storage capacity, and uh, they are modes that are inhabit the lowest dimensional sphere yeah. and they are holographic and we can trace their origin. Now, the great thing about this thing is that this is an explicit model. You know who is who and you know where these modes are coming from. It's, this is not now some kind of mysterious modes that we don't know where they come from. We, we, we can clearly trace them. What is happening? It's, it's, a, it's a very profound, it's, it's in, in the same time, it's a simple but profound phenomenon. So what happens is that because different modes interact through negative energy connections, excitation of one mode makes other modes slightly gapless. And then there is a critical state in which once you excite one mode, the rest of the modes become gapless. And because of original spherical symmetry in d dimensions, their number scales as d minus one dimensional sphere, okay? And we know who these modes are. Now, um, they are open questions, right? So uh, we can, uh, I mean, we can ask this question. Uh, first of all, does this theory represent this simple model of a, of a, of a field on a, of a, of a non-relativistic field? Does, it, does this theory really represent a theory, a model of true uh, quantum gravity, black hole uh, entropy and holography? That's the first question. Uh, I think the answer is it captures something, okay, of this. I, I think, but this is just my, my, my way, my, uh, my, my thinking. You don't have to, uh, of course, you, you have to take it. I think that this is what happens in black holes. This is precisely what happens. So when we, in order to create a black hole, you have to put, we have to excite some of the soft modes, some of the modes to high level. In other words, you have to put a lot of particles together. And putting a lot of particles together makes certain modes coupless at some point. And that's the point where you form a black hole. And that's, that's the way black holes accommodates uh, very high entropy. I think that's the reason. Uh, it's, it, it otherwise would be a, a fantastic coincidence that this is what is happening here and have, it has nothing to do with, with, with black holes, although both give you the same result. Okay, but again, this, this is just a speculation, as I said. Um, now, the second conclusion could be that the, 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 en the area low entropy, which w we thought that was fundamental property of gravity, goes well beyond gravity. So, in other words, there are other systems of nature 
uh, that has, has the, the, used the same mechanism of, of, of array entropy for enhanced information storage, enhanced memory storage, okay? And so the black holes are just one example and there are other systems, non, in particular non-gravitational ones. Now, these two statements are not inter-exclusive, so I think both are true. Um, now, um, then there's a third uh, possibility that this is just a coincidence, okay? So just simply a coincidence has nothing to do with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the way black hole del delivers uh, high entropy uh, and area law. Now, even if this, this is the case, this would be an extremely remarkable coincidence because, again, this will show that uh, black holes don't have monopoly on area law entropy. There are other systems which uh, exhibit the, the similar behavior. Uh, and uh, again, these other systems are not, then are not less important than black holes because the reason, as I, let me remind you, that the reason why we're so fascinated with black holes, as long as information is concerned, precisely because of this property. That they, they have area low entropy, uh, they saturate bound, and they have exponentially enhanced capacity of memory storage. Now, if there are other systems which do the same but use a completely different mechanism, those other systems would be equally important. And it's very important to, to search for those systems. Okay? Uh, and then there are other questions. Of course, uh, uh, to, to better understand uh, these, te these technologies that we use in these different uh, seemingly complete disconnected fields of neural networks and gravity and quantum fields. Uh, so as we can see, they are sort of not so different. And so we should uh, we ask more, more deeper questions in, in, along this direction. So let me finish here. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Yeah. Questions? Ignatius? Uh, you are asking an excellent question, okay? This is precisely what the question that... So, so yeah, I don't know, yeah. So the question that Ignatius is asking is whether there could be systems that actually uh, do it better than black holes, okay? Now, this is the question that also bothers me to see whether... Now, this would be, of course, extremely strange uh, in the... So there, we can compare in real terms. Uh, real terms, what do I mean? We know that black holes saturate Bekenstein bound on information storage. Now, Bekenstein bound on information storage means that any system of size R uh, cannot have uh, more, uh, more entropy than area of this system measured in Planck units, okay? So in that, from that point of view, of course, if we use as, as measure as, as Planck momentum, the answer will be no. Of course, our brain, uh, if we measure it in Planck units, has much less information storage capacity than black hole. But, however, what could be is that, and there are some glimpses of it, uh, 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 in, in different uh, cases we can discuss later, that it could be that what happens is that there is a sort of modified relation. In other words, suppose I give you a system, it could be a neural network, could be a quantum field, with a uh, cutoff momentum, okay? And then you can ask this question whether the, you can do it better than the area in, that, in those units, okay, for that system. And so, in other words, there, there could be like scaled down uh, scaled down relation with the, uh, with the, the scaled down relation with, with, with Bekenstein bound. So that, that, that could be the case. But again, this is just a, these are just glimpses. This is an extremely important question, what you're asking. Yes, I, I mean, as, as we speak, I'm thinking about these type of questions. So, yeah. Uh, um, ju just a, a little doubt I have. I mean, in the model of the black hole uh, on which you also work, uh, yeah. Previously, I thought it was very important that the force is proportional to the energy itself. Yeah, this is what the um, self interaction. Absolutely, so not absolutely. just attractive, but also proportional to the. I mean, like gravity. No, no, yeah, you are absolutely right. And That's what I, I didn't say. see this ingredient in your general case. Yeah, yeah. So there are two things. No, thank, thanks for for asking this. In other words, there are two things. One is that. So one is that, so I can make the force to be simply attractive for a generic neural network. It will still have these states of enhanced memory capacity, exponentially. Sure, sure. 
But not every exponential enhancement of memory capacity is as powerful as, as the area law in Planck units. So in that thing, you are absolutely right. It sort of a little bit resonates with Ignatius's question. In other words, of course, I'm sure that if you really want to saturate the bound that area law to go in, in Planck units, for that you really need gravity, and probably gravity is unique. You are absolutely right. However, if you are only after the exponential enhancement of memory capacity and the area law in a different unit, okay? Uh, so then, so th then there are two sub questions. So first is that now we can be simply only after exp exponential enhancement of memory capacity, not, not necessarily area law. Then you don't need energy type coupling. And then there's a third possibility which I described, which would be this model in which uh, it, which is gravity-like, indeed. This is gravity-like, except, of course, here we don't have gravity. It's like we, interaction is proportional to the energy product of energies. Yeah, because, uh, if I can interrupt, because I thought the crucial ingredient was that if you add an extra link or neuron or something like this, the extra energy that you need is compensated by the binding energy. Exactly. The That's extra binding absolutely. energy. Absolutely. For that to happen, it seemed to me that you need really the proportionality no, of, that, but of the interaction. Yeah, but this, this is what, the, okay. what this the, does. There, there yeah, it yeah, does exactly. it. That's what I'm saying, but, yes. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So in other words, okay. this is I what thought it was important for the gapless idea, but uh, oh, this is, that is more general. No, this is important both for gapless and for area loss scanning. Yeah, yeah, but for so, gapless, you don't need it. No, for simply having some gapless mode, no, you okay. don't need it. Yes. No, okay. you don't need My it. Components. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Uh, Maybe I'll ask the last question. Uh, can you make a relativistic model of this type? Yeah, that, with yeah. higher derivative That's a good question, yes. Yeah, I, yeah I, I'm thinking about it, and so, so, some of my collaborators are thinking about it. This, um, as, as, as Gabriele has, uh, pointed out, so this sort of, with Cesar Gomez and other collaborators, uh, we had this idea of uh, understanding black holes in terms of precisely this sort of a large occupation number of graviton state with, uh, with, uh, with, with, the, with negative interactions and this kind of stuff. So this fully resonates with those ideas. The difference is that there we were making explicit hypotheses about the structure of black holes. Here, the difference is I'm here, I'm not making any hypothesis about black holes, I'm just designing a system which exhibits the same property. But, so now the question would, interesting question would be to first generalize this to uh, relativistic uh, systems, yeah, that's right. Uh, there, I don't see a fundamental obstacle. I, it looks like uh, it looks like that this generalization to simply relativistic systems should be straightforward. Again, uh, if we want to saturate bound in terms of Planck units, then the story is different. So, if you want to saturate bound in terms of some 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 other scale, in other words, let's say I complete this to a model of a scalar field. Mm -hmm. uh, without any gravity, then I'm free to use whatever scale I like there, and it doesn't have to be gravitational interaction. What this indicates is that the interaction should be derivative-like. So there should be derivative type interaction in order to have this type of enhancement. So yeah, that, that, that looks like it. Yeah, so it will be very interesting to see that the only possible completions <laughs> of this type of models are gravitational. Then that would be, um, yeah, that would be another great thing, yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. I think we should stop here. Thank you again. Yeah.